The psalmist once declared, I lift up my eyes to the hills, from whence does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. How reassuring it is to know that in a world of sweeping changes, we have someone to be able to stand on, and that is God, and there are things in life in which we can count on and count as foundation, family, friends, and faith. Good morning. On this warm and uncomfortable Sunday, we thank you for coming to church and worshiping God. We praise God for the advent of air conditioning. And we thank God for all those who have the foresight in the property committee to uh, convince us, persuade us, to prod us that this is necessary uh, to be able to truly enjoy our company with each other. Amen. We are delighted by your friendship and your presence and your faithfulness to God. For those who are us uh, through Facebook, we welcome you as well. Let us proceed now with our call to worship. To know the warmth of love. To be confident of our worth. To be washed over with grace. This is to know a bit of God. Let us sing our opening hymn. we can bow our hearts, our minds, and approach God and ask for forgiveness. Holy God, we ask for your help, your power, your spirit, so that we can amend our lives and grow more each day into the image of Christ.
confess that we have not lived out your call to share in an abundant life and unconditional love. My friends, beloved in Christ, let us take this time of silence in order to explore how we can grow in our faith and who we need to forgive so that we can grow into our fullness in Christ. around to a more inclusive way of living. So we ask you to do that. We ask you to give us the courage to change. We ask you to give us the energy, intelligence, imagination, and love to be your people in all that we say and do. Amen. Our power to claim forgiveness for ourselves and to forgive others comes from what God offers in scriptures. This is what the Bible says. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removed our transgressions from us. Amen. One of the ways in which we will visibly experience how God forgives is through the sacrament of baptism. And this is why we are so delighted today uh, to be able to perform or officiate the sacrament of baptism for two beautiful children uh, in Austin, Cox and Jason Rain. Austin is the great grandson of the late Austin Cox, so one of the pillars of our church. So we are delighted to be able to continue with that legacy of doing ministry uh, in our church. So the liturgy for the sacrament of communion is included in our bulletin, uh, and we encourage you to follow along um, so we can all be blessed. Hear the word of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is above all, and strength of all. Baptism is the sign and seal of God's promise to his covenant people. In baptism, God promises by grace alone to forgive our sins, to adopt us into the body of Christ, the church, to send the Holy Spirit to renew daily and cleanse us, and to resurrect us to eternal life. This promise is made visible in the water of baptism. Water cleanses, purifies, refreshes, sustains. Jesus Christ is the living water. Through baptism, Christ calls us to new obedience, to love and trust God completely, to forsake the evil of the world, and to live a new and holy life. Yet when we fall into sin, we must not despair of God's mercy, nor continue in sin. For baptism is the sign and seal of God's eternal covenant of grace with us. On behalf of the consistory, this moment we would like to ask Zita and William Horst Sheffield and uh, Godparents to please come forward and stand right here. Yes, yes. Yes. So make sure so that you can follow along with the program. And there'll be some questions in bold you'll be asked to answer. What are the names of these children? Austin Jackson. I always get a double take when I ask these questions, you know, but it, 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 these are not a trick question. These are, this is a 500 year old liturgy. We ask you now to declare your faith before God and Christ Church, 
that we may rejoice together and welcome you in Christ. Beloved of God, I ask you before God and Christ Church to reject evil, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and to confess the faith of the Church. Do you renounce sin and the power of evil in your life and in the world? Who is your Lord and Savior? Will you be faithful members of this congregation and through worship and service seek to advance God's purposes here and throughout the world? Will you promise to instruct your children in the truth of God's word and the way of salvation through Jesus Christ? to pray for Austin Lehman and Jackson Rain, to teach Austin uh, Lehman and Jackson Rain to pray, and to train Austin Lehman and Jackson Rain in Christ's way by your example, through worship, and in the nurture of the church. In our tradition, these, co these promises are not only made by parents, grandparents, and God, uh, godparents, but also by the church. Uh, we're all a traveling community here. So to that end, please let us rise. we we'll become several good godfathers and godmothers of these beautiful boys. Do you promise to love, encourage, and support these children by teaching the gospel of God's love, by being an example of Christ, by Christian faith and character, and by giving the strong support of God's family in fellowship, prayer, and service? You may be seated. You get to hold this for me. Hold it. No worries. Okay. We thank you, O God, for the gift of baptism. In this water, you confirm to us that we are buried with Christ in his death, raised to share in his resurrection, and are being renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Pour out on us your Holy Spirit, so that those here baptized may be washed clean and receive new life. To you be all honor and glory dominion and power, now and forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Austin Newman and Jackson Rain. Austin, for you, Jesus came into the world, for you he died and conquered death. All this he did for you, we love because God first loved us. Austin, therefore, I baptize you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Yes, okay, good. Jackson, for you, Jesus came into the world. For you, he died and conquered death. He did this for you because he loves you. And we love because God first loved us. Therefore, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Great job. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only King and Head of the Church, Austin Lumen and Jackson Rain are now received into the visible membership of the Holy Catholic Church, engaged to confess the faith of Christ, and to be God's faithful servants until life's end. Let us welcome these new members with a round of applause.
two pews work right here. Oh, we got so many of them. This is great. You want to come over? Yes. Mark right here, too. Whoops. There we go. <laughs> we can go here. We can go here. What a crowd. This is great. Hey, guys. Now, I know, oh, thanks, that it's summer. You know it's summer, yes? Oh, I'll bet you do. Me too. Let me get this all set first. Okay. I don't need it too much. Stay. All right. You don't need it that bad. All right. Um, but does that mean you don't do any work? Does that mean you've got nothing to do that that has to do with work, maybe around the house? What kind of stuff do you do that you would think of as work, even though it's summer? Oh, trash? Do you? Do you have a little trash job? Anybody else? Some work around the house that that you are expected to do? Yes, take care of the cat, right? Feed the cat? Very good. Bedroom? Yep. Anything else that's kind of work that you might need to do around the house? Go ahead. Make, make your bed. Excellent. Yeah. Well, you think about it for me. You want to, you want to tell me? Uh -huh. Ah, clean the playroom. Every once in a while, right? Because it gets pretty nasty. Um, so there are jobs around the house, and I have jobs around the house too. My first real job, like when I was a youngster, like 15 I think I was, was I bust tables. You know what that means? In other words, I worked in a restaurant and my job, it wasn't much fun, but my job was to, when, when the people that were eating at the restaurant were done, I would take my big dish pan and take the, the, the dishes and put them in a dish pan and bring them to the kitchen for the dishwasher to wash them. That's what a bus boy does or a bus person. You, you gather up the dirty dishes in the restaurant. It was a job. And it was a good first job for me. You know, there are jobs too uh, that people do right here in the church. There's all kinds of jobs. As a matter of fact, you were walking around this morning on one really neat job that was done in this church. This carpet is new. It's so new, I don't even think it's a month old. This nice red carpet all over. That is one job that was done around the church. So there are several church jobs that people do. Like this one is a cleaner, right? Custodian. You probably have a custodian in your school, don't you? How about, here's another job from a church job that someone has, and that's a, working in the office, like right? church secretary. And I'll bet in school, as soon as you walk into school, there's a secretary there, isn't there, in the main office at school? And how about a food kind of job? Um, either the food pantry, people that work at the food pantry, or after the service today, you're going to go to Cordes Hall, down the, down the hall here a little bit, and enjoy some refreshments. Well, somebody prepared that, right? So there, there's some church jobs. And then, too, there is what we call here the music ministry, right? There are folks here that sing and play as part of the service. And then there are some committees, too. There are people that meet once a month or so and make decisions about things that go on in the church. And they even make decisions, you know, about money and how money is to be spent. And I missed one pretty darn important job. Where's the pastor? Where did he go? <laughs> this is as close as I could get to uh, a caricature of Pastor Luis. <laughs> it's the best I can do. <laughs> so there's... Lots, lots of jobs that are going on around here in, in church. Can you imagine, though, if, <clears throat> let's say, go back to your house for a minute, or your school. Can you imagine if none of that, the jobs that you have, if none of them even got done? For example, your 
living room or your bedroom in your house. If it never got done, or the kitchen, the jobs in the kitchen at your house never got done, you would come into the house and it would look pretty nasty, wouldn't it? It would be, it would be pretty disorganized. When you go to school in the fall, in September, and you walk into that classroom, do you think it's going to get, look nice or messy? No. No, I don't think so. Those teachers are there, take my word for it, they're there way ahead of time so that that first day when you come into that classroom, it's going to look really nice. The walls decorated and all that stuff. And can you imagine walking into your classroom with it just totally clutter and disorganized and confusing? So doing work, whether it's during the school year, whether it's in the summer, or getting some work done at home is, is a good thing. Now what does that have to do with the Bible? What does that have to do with God? God wants us to do work, our work, without complaining. Now I know there's some grown-ups in the congregation who are sitting there going, wait a minute, where does it say that? I never did that. Well, it's in Colossians, so look it up. <laughs> I did my homework. <laughs> Um, and so, when we're asked to do things around the house, I'll say it one more time, we're supposed to be willing to do it without, without complaining. And that, we know, is what's pleasing to God, is to do our chores and do our work, even, though, even during the summer, without complaining. I'm going to say a prayer, and then we can get up and go back to our seats, okay? Dear God, help us to remember that even though it's summertime, if we're asked to do some chores or some work around the house, whether it's for us or whether it's to benefit other people, to do it without complaining because we know that it is pleasing to you. Amen. Good. Let's go back to our seats. Thank, uh, as always, Brian Fallis for his thoughtful and meaningful children's sermon. God always uses him as a vessel to illustrate a broader truth. It's a truly a gift to be able to uh, share God's word with all of God's people, but especially the children, to be able to communicate as beautifully as he does and reaching us, the adults. Uh, so thank you. Um, we're, we're grateful. And we're grateful to the parents, uh, grandparents, all who are committed to this process of faith. Today's lesson comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 32. It's not a hard book to find. It's the first book in the Bible. So even if we're not um, deeply knowledgeable of scriptures, all we have to do is open it up to the first few pages, and there it is. Chapter 32, verses 22 to 31. The same night he arose, and took his, his wives and maids and eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything he had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and Jacob's thigh was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, Let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall be uh, Jacob no more, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, tell me, I pray your name. But he asked, what is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God's face to face, and yet my life is preserved. Here is wisdom. May God bless your understanding this reading from God's word. Amen. Have you ever looked at something, and once you tried it, you discovered how challenging the discipline of that thing truly was? For me, it was about learning to ride a bike. I think I was about seven years old. 
I remember watching an older cousin glide on his bike on a balmy day like today. He went up and down the street. He cruised effortlessly. He did a zigzag. He did a pop a wheelie. And I said to myself, I can do that. I asked to borrow his bike. I got on it, and after a few efforts, I wobbled, panicked, and tumbled sideways. It took a few bruises and scrapes for me to learn how to keep my balance and pedal nice and steady. Didn't want to quit, and I thank God my older cousin, who would push me along and gradually say, strive forward and stay steady. The other thing that I thought was easy was what my father did for a living as a painter. I would walk by sometimes and see him mounted on a four-story building, scraping the facade of a brick building. And I said, why is he complaining about being tired when he comes home from work and doesn't want to play catch? Anybody can do that. It's just painting. When I was about 15 and I wanted to break into the work industry, he said, come on, and join the family business. And I remember that as I went up the stairs and the scaffolding and I was looking and people started to look smaller and smaller and smaller. I said, oh, this isn't easy. And then when I thought all I had to do was pop a paint, paint, can of paint open and start painting, I said, no, 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 the prep was first. You got to scrape, then use a wire brush, then you got to stir the paint, and then you have to use this brush that was very heavy. It felt like a baseball glove, right? How heavy it was. And after an hour or two, when the sun was baking me and I was sweating profusely and my forearm started to ache and my back muscles started to stiffen, I realized this isn't easy as I thought. There are things in life that appear to us to be easy, but they're not. Think about parenting. Think about running a business. Think about learning how to drive, especially learning how to drive stick shift. Hitting a baseball planning a vacation, cooking at a restaurant, getting in front of a classroom to teach a group of students, serving on the church's consistory. There are things that look easy from the outside, but once you're in the throes of it, you realize that they're not as easy as they appear to be. The example I just provided come from the conversations I've had with many of you over the years. And in our conversation, I have learned that there's a common thread and making things appear easy um, has to do with keeping the discipline to strive and stay with the struggle, even when there are obstacles and things are not as easy as they appear to outsiders. One of the things that may look easy from the outside, but in actuality requires a lot of work, is keeping a good relationship with another person. Given that we're all unique, that we're not constituted to think the same way, that our egos can sometimes surface and interfere with our ability to do what is right. Learning to get along with people and do the right thing in any given circumstance is not an easy thing to do. Relationships require heavy lifting. Relationships require a lot of work. When I was about 10 years old, two of my favorite television programs were The Brady Bunch and The Jeffersons. In my naivete, I thought that I knew a real-life Carol Brady and a real-life Louise Jefferson in my aunt named Dora. Carol Brady had the ability to pull the family together so seamlessly when they were squabbling over trivial matters, and so did my aunt, who was the mother of nine children. Louise Jefferson had the skill to keep a rambunctious husband from going off the rails, and I said, there goes my aunt. She has the ability to reel in my uncle when he has the next big idea, or the next purchase, or the big investment he wants to make. But as I got older, I learned the family's coded language for gossip at social events. And I realized that my aunt Dora made things appear carefree because she was committed to confronting issues, struggling with those issues, and conquering those bad situations. So keeping a family together, settling internal family squabbles, addressing serious family problems were not as easy as they appear to be when I was looking at them as a teenager. It required a lot of work. Now our lesson this morning is a story about a younger brother named Jacob who is fleeing from his older brother named Esau. Jacob is fleeing because he tricked Esau out of an inheritance. At play were money, status, 
hierarchy, power dynamics, and we all know the story in one way or the other because we know that when it comes to family inheritances, it brings out the best and worst in each one of us. At the time that the story was written, the oldest sibling in the family was considered the sole family patriarch and the sole inheritor of any estate. Jacob did not like this custom and social arrangement, so he was able to bamboozle his blind father to give him the sole inheritance by passing for his brother Esau. Now there were no probate courts to look into this back then. All family disputes were handled mano a mano during a physical conf confrontation or through the sword. The problem was that Jacob by nature was not much of a scrapper or a fighter. He was groomed to be a domestic worker. So we can assume that he stood no chance to combat his older brother Isha, who was a skilled hunter and was brawny, according to the text. So when Isha vowed that he was going to take care of his brother for his crafty scheming, he meant it. And that proclamation spurred Jacob to run and hide for his life. Now, but Jacob was tired of running from a past mistake. And I think many of us can see ourselves in the narrative of our story. Some of us are emotionally and, and, and physically uh, and spiritually tired of having to run away from our past. He was tired of having to live with the tension that would simply not go away. He had an awakening that was brought on by a dream he had with angels descending up and down a ladder, which serves as a bridge story to the story that we read today. And in this dream, Jacob realized that he was not going to climb up the rungs of the ladder if he didn't make things right between God and earth. In Jacob's case, this meant confronting his past and striving to ask for forgiveness from his brother. If he were Jacob in this story, I ask what things in our past are we running away from? What things are holding us back from climbing our personal ladder and attaining a higher view of the world? What things are stopping us from gaining closer access to God and by extension experiencing the true transformation that comes from being in God's presence? We can't be truly enlightened if we're not in the presence of God. So Jacob wakes up from this dream and he is determined to restore his family honor and to restore his own respect and to make things right with his older brother. Restoring the family honor and respect would involve a wrestling match. And here in the story, we are thrusted into this scene that seems like a ripoff from an MMA uh, cage fight. Jacob is fighting, and he is struggling. And like I said earlier, he's not much of a fighter. But he realizes that he needs to experience a breakthrough. Now, in verse 25, uh, we're told that this fighter is an ish, which is a man. And the fight lasts all night. And there are things that appear easy, just like learning how to reach a point of awareness, but they're not, right? Many of us ask ourselves, I know I have a problem with a family member. Should I pick up that phone and call that person? We hear that whisper. But then we hear another whispering voice that says, but they started to fight. Don't call them. Let them sit with it. Right? Or, should I truly deal with this outstanding problem from my past, which is haunting me like a ghost? Or, ah, just sleep through it. Let it go. It's not a big thing. So like Jacob, we find ourselves struggling with our conscience, struggling with our emotions, because as human beings, we are made up of many things. Our personal stories, and our personal emotions. Thank God that Jacob recognized that he needed to give in to his better self or to his better angel. And he was able to let go of that problem by recognizing that he needed to continue to fight because there are things in this world that are worth fighting for, such as family, community, relationships, our sense of dignity and honor. So that's the first point. My second and final point is that we truly can experience full awareness until we allow ourselves to be transformed by the process that we're struggling with. For some of us, it means seeking therapeutic intervention and staying with the process and not quitting 
when our therapist leads us to a dark place where we really don't want to be. Or it could be hearing uncomfortable truths from people who love us uh, and we don't want to accept those truths because we feel that it doesn't apply to us. Or it could be enduring a coursework that would allow us to grow in our vocation or our profession because we said we don't have the time to do this or we really don't want to do this at this point of our lives, but it means staying with a process. Thank God that Jacob wrestled all night because transformation is not a flash in a pan thing. It requires a fight, right? It requires a long night, and he did that. And as a result of that, he was touched in such a way that his physical body changed he developed a limp, and his name was changed from Jacob, which means a supplanter or someone who likes to cheat, to Israel, which can mean God prevails. When we engage our process with integrity, with intentionality, and with authenticity, we can experience the breakthroughs in life that we are all yearning for, because we're all tired of running. We all are tired of not being comfortable in our own skin. We all want to live in the freedom that comes from embracing ourselves and our past and moving on. The good news is that God knows our story, God knows our name, God is willing to meet us where we are if we're willing to engage the process and struggle with the process. Ultimately, Jacob meets with Isha, his oldest brother. They reconcile, even they, they go their own their merry way. But the meeting didn't end with a clash, it ended with an embrace. So to summarize, there are things that we face that appear easy, but they require a struggle. I believe that if we develop the awareness and thrust ourselves in the hands of God, we'll be given a new name and a new identity. We'll be given an opportunity to thrive if we're willing to stay with the discipline of striving forward. Amen. Hopefully, um, you have the communion kit. If you don't and wish to partake, please raise your hand and we will get you one. Okay. It was Passover, and Jesus drank that in our upper room. And he met with his for the last time to have a meal and the Bible tells us that Jesus after the meal took a piece of bread he broke it and he blessed it and he said take eat this is my body broken for you do this in remembrance of me the bread that we partake of is the body of Christ I think that God has a sense of humor, right? I was talking about wrestling, <laughs> wrestling with something and struggling with something. And here I am. Out of all the Sundays I've been doing this for the you're struggling with all of this. Body of Christ broken for you. You can partake of it. In the same way, Christ poured wine into one single cup, which symbolizes the unity of faith that should exist among us and between us, and we're bound together by the love of Christ. And he said, this is my blood shed for you, for the remission of our sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Beloved, every time that we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death of our Lord Jesus Christ until he returns. And as Christians, our hope is one day to be sitting at the table that the prophets uh, describe, including Revelation, but we will have one last feast together, and we will be together with those who have predeceased us to have communion with Christ. Amen. May the peace of God be with you this morning. Let us greet one another, wave back one another in Christian love.
be seated. Once again, uh, we are delighted to be in your presence, worshiping the Christ, growing in our faith. We thank all of you who are here, and again, our gratitude for allowing us to exercise God's ministry of baptism. So forever, uh, Austin and Jackson will be part of the fabric of the history of this church and our lives, and we thank them for being uh, a blessing to the parents and grandparents and all who are involved for making sure that this happened. So I'm sure that um, Lois is very happy, and so is the family as well for, um, for, for this wonderful blessing, to see this wonderful tradition uh, continue in our life of the church. Uh, we open up this part of the service to share an announcement time, so to that end, are there any announcements in the life of the church? They're quiet refreshments before Pam has to remind me. After worship, we're all invited to go to Cortis Hall, our social fellowship hall, and partake of light refreshments and continue to deepen the bonds of our friendship through conversation um, and food items. So we, uh, as always, encourage you to continue to pray for one another and to explore ways in which we can live out our faith. And uh, with that being said, let us share now in our pastoral prayer, followed by our pastoral... Anyone want to say something? Okay. Pastoral prayer, and then... Um, our closing hymn. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to gather today. We ask that you continue to keep us safe and to keep us strong in Christ, to allow us to draw on the inspiration that comes from this wonderful uh, baptism experience, to remind us that you cleanse us, clean us, with the water which is Christ, keep us pure and whole. We ask that you uh, continue to bless our church family. We thank you for the addition of young families to the life of the church. We thank you for everything you're doing in our midst, your Holy Spirit moving among us and in us, keeping the church vile, strong. We ask that you bless all the ministries of this church and all who work to bring Christ to the world. Continue to be with our brothers and sisters who are recovering and healing, hospitals, nursing home facilities, in their personal home. In your name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
People of God, thank you for your faithful worship. Thank you for journeying with us as we leave this sacred space to go on into the world, continue to remain cool and safe. And may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit continue to nourish and sustain the bonds of our friendship in Christ and through Christ. Worship ascended. Let the service begin. Amen. <laughs>